Um, yes, you'll see that I actually misremembered the title. So the title on the handout is Descartes on Sensory Error instead of Descartes on Errors of the Senses, but it doesn't really make much difference. Um, <clears throat> and I'm also going to be doing something that's slightly different from the abstract that I've sent in. I am going to discuss um, two forms of sensory or, or, quote, sensory error that Descartes discusses, but I'm also going to suggest um, right at the end that there might be a third kind of sensory error that he doesn't, um, I think, uh, yeah, really well. acknowledge. Oh, OK, I'll speak up. OK, so Descartes' most famous work is the Meditations on First Philosophy. And famously, that work begins with Descartes' decision to demolish all his opinions through doubt. So he writes, and this is the first quotation on the handout, it's the first few lines of the meditations. He says, some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I had accepted as true in my childhood and by the highly doubtful nature of the whole edifice that I had subsequently based on them. I realized that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and start again right from the foundations. If I wanted to establish anything at all in the sciences, that was stable and likely to last. Now, he reasons that the demolition will be most easily accomplished by undermining the foundations on which his existing beliefs rest. And that means casting doubt on the senses. So he writes, this is the second quotation on the handout, whatever I have up till now accepted as most true, I have acquired either from the senses or through the senses. But from time to time, I have found that the senses deceive. Right. So here he's deciding to doubt all his opinions, to do so by going for the principles on which his opinions have rested and introducing doubt about the senses, the idea that the senses deceive, the idea of sensory error as a reason to doubt the senses. Now, Descartes has very often been, and still is, I think, viewed as a philosopher whose main preoccupation is the threat of scepticism. According to this view, Descartes' project in philosophy is to try to defeat scepticism once and for all. And he pursues this project by advancing the strongest sceptical doubts he can muster and showing that they can be defeated by finding a form of certainty that's proof against any doubt. So, on this reading, in the first meditation, he points out that the senses sometimes deceive, as we've just seen, that we're often deceived in dreams, and finally, that for all we know, we might be subject to wholesale deceit by God or by an evil demon. So that we might go wrong even when we add two and three or count the sides of a square, as he says. Then, in the second meditation, Descartes finds that knowledge of his own existence and his own mind is proof against sceptical doubt. Even if he's being deceived, he's still thinking, and if he thinks, then he must exist. So that's the famous cogito that gives his, him the first, his first certainty. But knowledge of one's own mind is a pretty slender foothold from which to rebuild knowledge of the world. So in the third meditation, stay, so the story goes, Descartes has to wheel in God to pull him out of a sceptical hole he's dug for himself. So mixing metaphors. So this, I hope, is a pretty familiar picture of Descartes' progress in the first three meditations. And I can't think that I'm the only one to have felt disappointed when I first read this by the sudden appearance of God as this kind of all-purpose solution after the exhilarating doubt and then recovery of the first two meditations. There's a bit of a sense of with one bound he was free. So the, the image of the solitary iconoclastic thinker who's striking out into the unknown, rejecting all for his former beliefs in the first meditation is very modern and quite appealing, quite, as I said, exhilarating. And it seems that it's a bit of a climb down to have this kind of shamefaced appeal to a traditional deity to rescue him in the third meditation, to sort of just solve this problem of defeating scepticism. It looks like, on the one hand, we've started out with this very modern picture of this solitary thinker doubting everything and going to uh, find certainty just based on his own resources. And then we've got a kind of appeal to a kind of 
medieval, a kind of renovation of a medieval argument for the existence of God that gets wheeled out in the third meditation. Now, I think that Descartes does have one foot in the medieval world, the world of the Aristotelian schoolmen, and one foot in the modern world, the early modern world. Right? He's on a cusp between the two. Right? He's not called the father of modern philosophy for nothing, as Anthony said. Right? He's, he's there at the beginning. Um, I think John Carriere's recent book on Descartes, a reading of the meditations called Between Two Worlds, catches it very well. Right? He's between... He's, a kind of, he's on the cusp between the world of medieval Aristotelianism and the early modern world, um, what we call modern philosophy. Right? Although, obviously, it's 17th century. But although I think that it's true that Descartes has, these two, has, has a foot in the medieval world and a foot in the modern world, what I want to do to you tonight is to look at Descartes' treatment of sensory error, Descartes' treatment of the error of the senses, not as part of a heroic quest against scepticism, so in the model of the kind of reading that I've just sketched, where Descartes' uh, overriding preoccupation is to defeat scepticism by generating the, most, the strongest, most corrosive form of scepticism in the first meditation and then trying to, um, to answer it by appeal, by sort of wheeling in God because he can't think of anything better. But to look at Descartes' treatment of sensory error, Descartes' treatment of the error of the senses, as part of a very different project. So in recent years, philosophers have paid more attention to Descartes the natural philosopher, as he might have styled himself, or Descartes the scientist, as we might put it. So in recent years, scholars of early modern philosophy um, even in the analytic tradition, are paying more attention to the connections between Descartes' science, Descartes, what he calls his physics, his projects in natural philosophy, and his, the kind of philosoph the philosophical works that we're all familiar with, like the meditations. So what I want to do now is to just give you a bit of a, a background on this, um, this side of, of Descartes. So if it hadn't been for the condemnation of Galileo, the first work Descartes would have published would have been a work of science. In 1633, Descartes was about to publish a book that he called The World, in which he aimed, as he modestly put it to a correspondent, to explain all the phenomena of nature, that is, all of physics. That's from a letter to Mersenne of 1629. He was about to publish this book when he heard about the condemnation of Galileo from the bookseller when he went to get Galileo's get latest book. So Galileo, of course, had been condemned by the Inquisition for maintaining that the Earth moved around the sun. Now, the movement of the Earth around the sun was an integral part of the physics of the world. Right? In the world, this explanation of the whole of nature, uh, the motion of the planets around the sun is explained in terms of a kind of motion, a very fast spinning motion of the sun, which in Descartes' view is a mass of very, very small particles spinning very, very fast. This spinning creates an outward pressure by means of centrifugal force. And this, it's that force pressing against our eyes which gives us the sensation of light. That's why we perceive the, the sun as the source of light. It's also this same motion generated by the sun, this vortex that's produced by the spinning sun that carries the planets around the sun in a circle. So as Descartes acknowledged himself in his letters to Mersenne, the motion of the earth was at the centre of his physics, of his, the physics that was presented in the world. Now even before he heard about the condemnation of Galileo, Descartes was worried about theological reactions to his philosophical system. So if you look at quotation three on your handout, this is from an earlier letter before 1633, a letter of 1629, where he says, theology has been so deeply in the thrall of Aristotle that it is almost impossible to expound another philosophy without it seeming to be directly contrary to the faith. Right. So there was a synthesis of Christian theology with Aristotelian philosophy, which was due in large measure to the work of Thomas Aquinas, which had become, by the time of Descartes, had become the sort of, I suppose, the received wisdom. Right? This was the kind, this sort of 
so-called scholastic Aristotelianism, the Aristotelianism of the schools, that is the universities, as Descartes put it, um, was the standard um, view that was taught in the universities. It was the view to which Descartes was exposed at the Jesuit College La Fleche, where he studied uh, before he went to the University of Poitiers to study law. So, as he's saying in this uh, quotation, this synthesis of theology with Aristotle created the, the, uh, the prospect of any kinds of attacks on Aristotle being seen as attacks on Christianity, right? as attacks on the faith, as attacks on theology. Right? Descartes thought that this, was, this synthesis was completely wrong. Right? He thought that you could... It was, in fact, that was what threatened the faith, because if you ally the faith to a false philosophy, then you threaten the faith. Right? So Descartes thinks that Aristotelianism is, Aristotelian, Aristotelianism is wrong, or at least wrong in certain ways that we'll see in a moment. But he doesn't uh, thereby question the tenets of the faith. In fact, the subtitle of the first edition of the Meditations says that in it, the immortality of the soul and the existence of God are demonstrated. And these were the two things that Christian philosophers were directed by the Catholic Church to uh, prove through the use of reason, right, the immortality of the soul and the existence of God. So Descartes, because of his anxiety not to court the fate of Galileo, because of his anxiety uh, about publishing anything of which the church might disapprove, decided not to publish the world. He decided to suppress it. Instead he decided to take a roundabout route. Right? He didn't give up his physics. He set out to create the conditions for a more favourable reception for his physics. Right? He says this retrospectively in the uh, preface to his, the Principles of Philosophy, which he published in 1644, which in effect present his physics in a more palatable form. Right? In, between, in between 1633 and 1644, when he published the Principles, he published first the discourse, discourse on the method with essays, which he describes as samples of what can be achieved using his method. And there are all sorts of hints in the discourse about all these results, which he could divulge if conditions were made right. right? So if he was protected from any kind of um, theological uh, backlash, as it were. And then in 1641, he published the Meditations. Right. And he wrote to Mersenne, this is the fourth quotation on your handout, which is just before the publication of the Meditations, I may tell you between ourselves that these six meditations contain all the foundations of my physics. But please do not say so, because those who favour Aristotle would perhaps have more difficulty in approving them. Right. Descartes was trying to get the approval of the theology faculty of the Sorbonne for the meditations at this point. I hope that those who read them will imperceptibly become accustomed to my principles and recognize the truth in them before they notice that they destroy those of Aristotle. Right. So Dan Garber has described the meditations as a kind of Trojan horse, right, which is supposed to take the principles of Cartesian philosophy, as it were, behind the Aristotelian lines. Right? So by reading the meditations, you will be imperceptibly converted from an Aristotelian to a, a Cartesian. So the metaphysics in the meditations, then, are the foundations of Cartesian physics. So it's the simile that he gives, this comparison of philosophy with a tree that he gives in the preface to the French edition of the Principles of Philosophy. It's the fifth quotation on your handout. He says, the whole of philosophy is like a tree. The roots are metaphysics, the trunk is physics, and the branches emerging from the trunk are the, all the other sciences, which may be reduced to three principles, one's namely medicine, mechanics, and morals. Right? So metaphysics, the roots, are the foundations that support the physics. Right? So if the meditations contains the foundations of his physics, it contains the metaphysics that supports his physics. So if we think of the meditations as part of Descartes' campaign to replace the principles of Aristotle with the principles of Cartesian physics instead of as this campaign to defeat scepticism once and for all, then the progress of the first three meditations looks very different from the kind of picture that I sketched earlier on. According to Cartesian physics, the physical world consists of matter 
divided into parts with different shapes and sizes and moving in different ways. Right? The nature of this matter is everywhere the same. It's simply to be extended in three dimensions to take up space. Right? All of the diversity in, that we see in the physical world is simply due to differences in the size and shape and motions of the parts of this uniform matter. This means then that the physical world as it exists in itself is different from the way it appears to our senses, right? where it appears to us to be coloured, to be warm, to have various parts of it have different tastes and smells and so on. In Descartes' view, our grasp of the fundamental nature of the physical world, our grasp of this matter that constitutes the physical world, comes not from the senses but from an innate intellectual idea that is placed in our minds by God the grasp of three-dimensional extension which enable us, enables us to understand geometry. Right? So if you think of the objects of solid geometry, that's what Descartes thinks matter is. And we understand the nature of matter, the fundamental nature of matter, through an innate geometrical idea placed in our minds by God. We also have innate ideas, according to Descartes, of thought, substance and God, which enable us to understand ourselves as thinking things as well as God. But these innate ideas are obscured by a preoccupation with the senses that begins in childhood and persists into adult life. This preoccupation gives rise to what Descartes calls many prejudices of the senses that obstruct our understanding of the true natures of body and mind. Right? And if you think about it, Descartes needs some kind of diagnosis of why it is that we're not immediately aware of the natures of body and mind on the basis of the, these innate ideas, because we've all got them, so why aren't we all natural Cartesians? So he says, in quotation six on your handout, he says, the senses often impede the mind in many of its operations, and in no case do they help in the perception of ideas. The only thing that prevents us all noticing equally well that we have these ideas, he's talking about innate ideas of mind and God, is that we are too preoccupied with perceiving the images of corporeal things. And again, he says in... Quotation seven, in metaphysics, there is nothing which causes so much effort as making our perception of the primary notions clear and distinct. They conflict with many prejudices derived from the senses which we have got into the habit of holding from our earliest years. So, in Descartes' view, Aristotelian philosophy simply codifies this naive preoccupation with the senses. It simply codifies these prejudices of the senses that we, de that we develop in childhood. Aristotle thinks that, as Aquinas puts it, knowledge is from the senses. According to Aristotle, the senses receive the likenesses of sensible things, right? so the way things are is the way that they appear to our senses. Objects possess qualities of greenness, real qualities of greenness, resembling greenness as we perceive it. All the materials of thought come through the senses. Right? And from those, the, the intellect abstracts the likenesses through it of, um, to which we, the intellect understands. So, hence the Aristotelian slogan, right, one which um, Descartes quotes in the Sixth Meditation, that there's nothing in the intellect that wasn't first in the senses. Because for, for the Aristotelians, the materials of thought come from the senses. Right? The senses are the fount of knowledge. So for the Aristotelians, there are no innate ideas. So Descartes thinks that these Aristotelian views, the, the view that all the materials of thought come from the senses, that the senses show us the world as, they, as it really is, these just come from our childhood preoccupation with the senses. So what Descartes says in quotation one, this first quotation on the handout, the first sentences of the meditations about false beliefs acquired in childhood, the large number of falsehoods I'd accepted as true in my childhood, isn't just a kind of casual reference to the kind of childhood errors that we all might think we make. Right? It's a reference to these prejudices of the senses that we've got into the habit of holding from our earliest years that obstruct our grasp of the innate ideas that give us, would give us a true understanding of the nature of the physical world, the nature of our minds, and the nature of God. And when Descartes says in quotation two on the handout, that whatever I've up till now accessed, accepted as most true, I've acquired either from the senses or through the senses, he's voicing the view 
that childhood, a view of childhood prejudice and Aristotelian philosophy. Right? The view he expects his readers to hold, the view he expects them to bring to the text, right? the view that he's seeking to unseat. Right. So it's not surprising that Descartes should speak of the benefit of the first meditation doubt as he does in the synopsis of the meditations. This is quotation eight on your handout. He says, although the usefulness of such extensive doubt is not apparent at first sight, its greatest benefit lies in freeing us from all our prejudices and providing the easiest route by which the mind may be led away from the senses. Right. So undermining our naive faith in the senses, which is what he says is one of the benefits of the first meditation doubt, what he's trying to do in reminding us that the senses deceive, presumably helps us to free us from the prejudice of the senses that we've imbibed in ch since childhood, Descartes thinks. Drawing the mind away from the senses, right, providing a route by which the mind may be led away from the senses, enables us to turn inwards and discover the intellectual ideas of mind and body that are innate in our minds, as we begin to do in the second meditation, right, when we discover that we are thinking things and when we begin to, discuss, to think of the piece of wax as an extended thing. It also enables us to discover the idea of God that's innate in our minds, as we do in the third meditation. Right. So if we think of the progression of the, third, the first three meditations in this way, it's not a kind of, uh, sort of all battle, battle with a kind of all-purpose sceptical opponent that then ends in a kind of shame-faced appeal to sort of deus ex machina who's just wheeled in to solve a problem that he's generated, manufactured but can't get out of. Right? Is God isn't now being wheeled in to pull Descartes out of a sceptical hole. Right? This discovery of the idea of God that's innate in our minds is the natural progression of a discovery of innate ideas that have been obscured by our preoccupation with the senses. Right? First our idea of ourselves as thinking things, first then our idea of uh, matter, extended things as... Uh, sorry, of bodies as uh, extended things, and then our idea of God as a perfect creator who's placed an idea of himself in our minds as, as he puts it, a hallmark on his work. But also the introduction of God, the discovery of, or the introduction of the proof of God's existence, uh, answers a question that naturally arises for somebody who believes in innate ideas. Ideas that are innate, that come not from the senses but from within, are ideas we possess by nature. But what's the provenance of ideas that we possess by nature? Right. Where does our nature come from? Right. Maybe, as one uh, writer responding to Locke wrote, maybe rather than seeds of truth that we find in our minds, why couldn't God sow tares in, seeds of tares in our minds? Right? Why, couldn't God sow, why couldn't there be seeds of weeds in our minds? Right? Where does our nature come from? Right. So we've discovered these ideas that come from our nature. What's their provenance? This worry about the origin of our nature is raised explicitly in the first meditation. So if you look at passage nine on your handout, it comes from the first meditation where God is, oh my God, easy mistake to make, where Descartes is first introducing um, this idea of an omnipotent God who might deceive us. This is quotation nine. He says, firmly rooted in my mind is the long-standing opinion that there is an omnipotent God who made me the kind of creature that I am. How do I know that he has not brought it about that there is no earth, no sky, no extended thing, no shape, no size, no place, while at the same time ensuring that all these things appear to me to exist just as they do now. What is more, since I sometimes believe that others go astray in cases where they think they have the most perfect knowledge, may I not similarly go wrong every time I add two and three or count the sides of a square, or in some even simpler matter, if that is imaginable. So here he's raising the worry that I think there's an omnipotent God who made me the kind of creature that I am, right? So God is explicitly identified as our creator, the author of our nature, how do we know that we haven't been given a deceitful nature? Right? An omnipotent creator can easily give us a deceitful nature, right? a nature such that we go wrong even when we add two and three. How do we know that hasn't happened? It doesn't 
You might think, well, you might respond, well, a benevolent God wouldn't give us a nature that makes us subject to deception in this way. But he's got an answer to that. Right? It's 10 on the handout. Perhaps God would not have allowed me to be deceived in this way since he's said to be supremely good. Right, that's the response. But if it were inconsistent with his goodness to have created me such that I'm deceived all the time, it would seem equally foreign to his goodness to allow me to be deceived even occasionally. Yet this last assertion cannot be made. Right, so it looks as though we can't appeal to God's benevolence to argue that God wouldn't make, give us a nature that made us decei- made us, allowed us to be deceived because we obviously do make mistakes, so we obviously do have a nature that allows us to be deceived. So how do we know that we don't have a nature that allows us to go wrong in all sorts of ways? It doesn't help to deny that we're the creations of an omnipotent God. Right, this is quotation 11 on the handout. Right, so you might get out of the worry that maybe we have a deceitful nature by saying, well, I don't think that I do. I am the creator of an omnipotent God. He says, perhaps there may be some who would prefer to deny the existence of so powerful a God rather than believe that everything else is uncertain. Yet since to be deceived and to err seem to be imperfections, the less powerful they make my original cause, the more likely it is that I'm so imperfect as to be deceived all the time. So, even if you think that you're not, we're not the creations of a, of a perfect God, of a power, an omnipotent God, we've got some kind of cause, and if it's less than perfect, it can very easily give us a less than perfect nature that makes us subject to constant deception. So, from this perspective then, the third meditation proof that we're creations of a perfect God removes these worries about the origin of our nature that were raised in the first meditation. Right? It removes the worry that we've got we're the products not of an omnipotent cause, but some kind of lesser cause that's produced an imperfect being that goes wrong all the time. And it removes the worry that we're the creators of an omnipotent, or, um, an omnipotent God who has made us such that we're constantly deceived. Right? Once we discover that our creator is perfect, right, that we're the creations of a perfect God, we know that Our creator isn't a deceiver. That's 12 on your handout. In every case of trickery or deception, some imperfection is to be found. The will to deceive is undoubtedly evidence of malice or weakness, and so cannot apply to God. So if our creator's perfect, our creator can't be a deceiver. Now, as I said, in the context of Descartes' commitment to innate ideas, the discovery about the origin of our nature answers an obvious question. How do we know our innate ideas are true? Indeed, at the end of the fourth meditation, Descartes gives a direct argument for the truth of clear and distinct ideas from the nature of God. That's uh, 13 on the handout. He says, every clear and distinct perception is undoubtedly something, and so cannot be from nothing. but necessarily has God for its author. God, I say, who is supremely perfect, who cannot be a deceiver on pain of contradiction, and therefore it is undoubtedly true. So suppose we're the creations of a perfect non-deceiving God, as Descartes claims to have discovered in the third meditation. Well, now we've got the problem of reconciling that with the fact that we're sometimes deceived. right? Because remember, back in the first meditation, Descartes said, well, but how can I be the creation of an omnipotent, benevolent God if I'm sometimes deceived? Surely a benevolent God wouldn't allow me to be deceived. The fourth meditation gives Descartes' response to this problem. It's not enough, Descartes says, to say that we make mistakes because we're less than perfect. Right, that's not enough to reconcile the fact that we make mistakes with the perfection of our creator, just to say, well, we're unlike God, we're not perfect, that's why we make mistakes. Because, if you look at 14 on your handout, He says, error is not a pure negation, but rather a privation or lack of some knowledge which somehow should be in me. And when I concentrate on the nature of God, it seems impossible that he should have placed in me a faculty which is not perfect of its kind, or which lacks some perfection that it ought to have. The more skilled the craftsman, the more perfect the work produced by him. If this is so, how can anything produced by the supreme creator of all things not be complete and perfect in all respects? So error involves what Descartes here calls, using medieval terminology, a privation. It involves the absence of something that should be present. It involves a kind of defect, 
not just, it's not just that we make mistakes because we're less than perfect, we're less perfect than God because we're finite. The fact that we make mistakes is that we are prone to error is the sign of some kind of defect. How can a defect exist in the creation of a perfect God? Right? Surely, as he says here, the creation of a perfect craftsman should itself be perfect. It shouldn't be subject to any defect, any kind of natural defect. But when we make errors, something's gone wrong. Right? There's a so how can a benevolent God have given us a nature that makes us liable to go wrong? Well, Descartes' explanation in the fourth meditation of how we can be liable to judgment error, right, how we can make false judgments, despite the perfection of our creator, exploits his claim that judgments are the product of two faculties, the intellect and the will. The intellect perceives ideas, right, so the intellect perceives the contents of perceptual judgments, while the will affirms or denies them. So you don't have a judgment until the will has affirmed or denied what the intellect perceives. Now these faculties, the faculties of intellect and will, are part of our nature. They're given to us by a perfect God. So, Descartes argues, neither of them is defective or subject to any privation. It's not deprived of anything that should be present. Right? It's not subject to any natural defect. So where does the privation or defect involved in error come from then? Well, Descartes' answer is that the privation or defect involved in error and judgment error arises from the fact that the freedom of our wills enables us to assent to ideas even when they're obscure and confused. So even when the intellect doesn't clearly and distinctly perceive the truth, we can still assent. And that's something we're liable to do. And when we do that, we'll be judging in error. Right, so if you look at 15 on your handout, Descartes says, if I simply refrain from making a judgment in cases where I do not perceive the truth with sufficient clarity and distinctness, then it is clear that I'm behaving correctly and avoiding error. But if in such cases I affirm or deny, then I'm not using my free will correctly. If I go for the alternative that is false, then obviously I shall be in error. If I take the other side, then it is by pure chance that I arrive at the truth, and I shall still be at fault. For it is clear by the natural light that the perception of the intellect should always precede the determination of the will. In this incorrect use of free will may be found the privation which constitutes the essence of error. Right, so there's, there's, a, there's something goes wrong, there's a defect there, and it's a defect in our use of free will. Right. Notice that for Descartes, you can make a true judgment and still be in error. Right, so he says, if I manage to embrace a truth that I, that I only obscurely and confusedly perceive, I'm still, even though I've formed a false belief, I'm sorry, even though I've formed a true judgment, a true belief, I'm still in error because I've assented when I didn't clearly and distinctly perceive. And it's only by accident then that I affirmed the truth. So for Descartes, false judgments are a subset, a proper subset of erroneous judgments. So you can see here, I'm sure you'll recognize a, private, a parallel to a traditional problem, so, sorry, a traditional solution to the problem of evil, right? How can a, how can a perfect God uh, allow the existence of evil, Descartes' problem is how can a perfect God allow for the existence of error in his creation? The traditional solution to the problem of evil is, well, evil's due to our misuse of our free will, it's due to sin. Descartes' solution to the problem of judgment error is, again, is also that we misuse our free, misuse our free will. Right? We misuse our free will to assent in cases where we don't clearly and distinctly perceive the truth. And that's underlined by what he says in... Uh, Quotation 16, he says, the privation, I say, lies in the operation of the will insofar as it proceeds from me. Right? So it's not anything that's proceeding from God that's defective. Right? It's, what, it's what we do with our free wills that's defective. Right? So it's our fault, not God's fault. Right. Okay. Now, the problem about the error of the senses, the problem about sensory error that I want to focus on finally comes into view. Right. The faculty of sensation, no less than the faculty of will and intellect, is also part of our God-given nature. So Descartes says in 17, this is from the sixth meditation, he says, I find in myself faculties for special modes of thinking, namely imagination and sensory perception. So, if the faculty of sensing is part of our God-given nature, 
How's he going to explain the fact that we're prone to errors of the senses? How's he going to reconcile that with the benevolence of our creator? Right? As we've seen, he's he writes frequently of the errors and prejudices of the senses. Right? This is the whole story about why it is that we, don't, we aren't aware of our innate ideas of thought and extension. Like why we fall into all the, why we develop this wrong Aristotelian philosophy because we're subject to all these errors and prejudices of the senses, these deceptions of the senses. So he writes also the obscurity and confusion of sensory perceptions, the way the senses deceive us and impede the intellect in its operations. His account of judgment error is an account of error involving the intellect, right? That's how it proceeds. It's on the basis of an account about the, rela of the basis of the relation between the intellect and the will. That doesn't, it doesn't even involve the faculty of sensation. So what's the explanation going to be of how a benevolent cr creator could have given us this faculty of sensation that leads us into error? Widespread pervasive error, according to Descartes. Well... Appearances can be deceptive. Right. I just said that Descartes' account of judgment error won't help to explain sensory error because it's an account of judgment error, not sensory error. But I think that actually a lot of what Descartes thinks we call and does himself call when he's speaking loosely, sensory error is actually judgment error. Let's see how this is supposed to go. We need to unpack this talk about errors and deceptions of the senses to see how he can reconcile the existence of sensory error with the benevolence of our creator. So Descartes holds that when we talk loosely about what the senses do, we're often actually, strictly speaking, talking about what the intellect does. So if you look at this long quotation 18 on the handout, uh, we'll be coming back to part of it later on, which is why I've, I've put all of it in. But it's, it's a passage from the sixth replies in which Descartes distinguishes th what he calls three grades or three stages of sensory response. So he says, if we're to get a clear view of what sort of certainty attaches to the senses, we must distinguish three grades of sensory response. The first is limited to the immediate stimulation of the bodily organs by external objects, right? So that just involves the body. The second grade comprises all the immediate effects produced in the mind as a result of its being united with the bodily organ that is, that is affected, and it should, should be in that way. Right? So, according to Descartes, external objects cause, if you think of vision, which is what he's primarily talking about here, external objects cause motions in the matter intervening between us and the object, that causes motions in the eye, that causes motions in the optic nerve, that causes motions in the pineal gland, and it's the pineal gland where Descartes thinks mind and body interact, so the motions in the pineal gland then have effects at what he calls the second grade of sensing, right? these immediate effects in the mind. Such effects include perceptions of pain, pleasure, thirst, hunger, colours, sound, taste, smell, heat, cold and the like, which arise from the union and, as it were, intermingling of mind and body, as explained in the sixth meditation. The third grade includes all the judgments about things outside us, which we would be which we have been accustomed to make from our earliest years. Right, so this, what's loosely called the third grade of sensing, of, of um, sensory response, actually includes judgments. So things that are done by the, that are the work of the intellect and will. So he enlarges on this in the next bit of the quotation. He says, for example, when I see a stick, rays of light are reflected off the stick and set up certain movements in the optic nerve and via the optic nerve in the brain, as I've explained at some length in the optics. This movement in the brain, which is common to us and the brutes, the animals, of course, who have no soul, no mind, is the first grade of sensory response. This leads to the second grade, which extends to the mere perception of the colour and light reflected from the stick. Nothing more than this should be referred to the sensory faculty if we wish to distinguish it carefully from the intellect. But suppose that as a result of being affected by this sensation of colour, I judge that a stick located outside me is coloured, and suppose that on the basis of the extension of the colour and its boundaries together with its position in relation to the parts of the brain, I make a rational calculation about the size, shape and distance of the stick. Although such reasoning is commonly assigned to the senses, it's clear that it depends solely on the intellect. I demonstrated in the optics how size, distance and shape can be perceived by reasoning alone, which works out any one feature from the other features. So he says, when from our earliest years we have made judgments and even rational inferences about the things that affect our senses, 
we refer them to the senses, even though being judgments, they're actually the work of the intellect. Right? So being judgments involving rational calculation, these things have got to be the work of the intellect because all the senses proper do, all that, as it were, all that happens in sensing proper, as it belongs to us as human beings, as combinations of mind and body, is what happens at the second grade of sensation, the second grade of sensory response, right? These, the immediate perceptions of pain, pleasure, thirst, hunger, colours, sound, taste, smell, heat, cold and the like. These sensations, these sensory ideas, which are caused immediately in the mind by emotions in the, the brain. So, that being so, these so-called prejudices of the senses are actually judgments, right? Obviously, they're prejudices, right? They're, a, a prejudice is a precipitate judgment, a judgment made without due thought. So what he calls, loosely speaking, prejudices of the senses are judgments, right? They're the work of the intellect and will. So if that's what, what, what we loosely call sensory errors or deceptions of the senses are, they can be accounted for by the story about judgment error, right? There's no new problem about reconciling them with the benevolence of God because we've got this account of how erroneous judgment is compatible with the benevolence of God, right? Erroneous judgment is God's fault, oh, sorry, is our fault, right? It's erroneous judgment is the product of our not thinking carefully enough before we judge, right? And if that's what so-called so -called errors of the senses, these um, prejudices of the senses are, then you can just apply the story about judgment error. The defect leading to these errors is our failure to remember to assent only when we perceive clearly and distinctly. But can we get him off, can he get off the hook that easily? Right? It seems, we might think, that we've got a natural tendency to form false beliefs prompted by our sensory perceptions. Right? According to Descartes, we all grow up believing that things are just as they appear to our senses. That, as he puts it, heat in a body is something exactly resembling the sensory idea of heat that's in me, that stars and towers and other distant bodies have the same size and shape which they present to my senses. That's why, we, that's why the Aristotelians believe that, because we all grow up believing this. And in the third meditation, he actually uh, suggests that this belief that external things resemble the sensory ideas they cause in us seems to be something we're taught by nature. But if we've got a natural tendency to make these false and erroneous judgments, these judgments about external things being resembling our sensory perceptions, doesn't that implicate God in the error? Right? Doesn't that mean that God has given us a tendency to error? How could that be compatible with his goodness? Now, I think many commentators on Descartes, uh, Gary Hatfield, for example, do think that we have such a tendency to error on Descartes' view, that we have a natural tendency to make these false beliefs uh, to form these false beliefs, these false judgments about the way that the external world is. That, I think, can't be right because it would conflict with this claim that, this is 19 on the handout, that God is the supreme being, he must also be supremely good and true, and it would be a contradiction that anything should be created by him which positively tends towards falsehood. Right? This is just reiterating the fact that what God creates is good and true. can't be subject to this um, natural tendency to error. And indeed, he says, this is in Sixth Meditation, this is 20 on the handout, everything that I'm taught by nature, that is by my God-given nature, contains some truth. By my own nature in particular, I understand nothing other than the, than the totality of things bestowed on me by God. Right? Since, since our nature comes from God, everything I'm taught by nature must contain some truth. So, I'm getting lost. And so it's just as well that Descartes explicitly denies that we've got a natural propensity to make these false judgments about the external world based on sensory perceptions. Descartes explicitly says in the sixth meditation that our propensity to make these judgments, these judgments that we all make since childhood, are not due to nature, they're not, uh, as it were, due to a tendency given to us by God, 
they're due to habit. So again, it's our fault. So if you look at 21, there are many thing, other things which we may appear to have been taught by nature. Right? So the appearance that was mooted in the third meditation turns out just to be an appearance. Many things which we may appear to have been taught by nature, but which in reality we acquired not from nature, but from a habit of making ill-considered judgments. And it's therefore quite possible that these are false. Cases in point are the belief that any space in which nothing is occurring to stimulate our senses must be empty, or that the heat in a body is something exactly resembling the idea of heat which is in me, or finally that stars and towers and other distant bodies have the same size and shape which they present to my senses, and other examples of this kind. Right, so these are all beliefs that Descartes thinks are false. Right? The belief about heat in a body is just motion of parts of a body. It's not anything resembling our sensation of heat. A space in which nothing is occurring to stimulate our senses is just that. Right? It's not empty space. There's no vacuum in the Cartesian universe because matter is extension. So you can't have a volume that's not occupied by body. So these our tendency to, make all the, to form all these false beliefs about the world based on sensory perceptions, again, is not a tendency given to us by God. It's not natural. It's a tendency, it's a habitual tendency that we develop in childhood, according to, to Descartes. So again, Descartes is not, again, God is not responsible. So why, but why then has God given us this faculty of sensory perception, this faculty of, that presents the world to us in this obscure and confused way? So and that we there that they, we go on to take as the basis for all these false habitual false judgments well descartes story is that the faculty of sensory perception is given to us by god to present external bodies to us present the world to us in ways that aid our preservation right? in fact not just external bodies but our own bodies so if you look at 22 on the handout my nature as a combination of mind and body does indeed teach me to avoid what induces a feeling of pain and to seek out what induces feelings of pleasure. But it doesn't appear to teach us to draw any conclusions from these sensory perceptions about things located, us, about things located outside us sorry, until the intellect has examined the matter. Right? So sensory perceptions are given to us to tell us what to avoid and what to seek out. Right? Things that cause painful sensations... You should avoid them. Things that cause pleasant sensations, pursue them. This is the office of sensory perceptions, according to, to Descartes, to help us to uh, find a way around the world while preserving the, the integrity of the mind-body composite. But we shouldn't draw conclusions about sensory perceptions, about things, about external things, without proper intellectual examination, as we did in childhood, right, where we formed prejudices, precipitate judgments, judgments made without before the intellect had examined the matter. So we habitually, Descartes thinks, misuse sensory perceptions. Right? This is a habit that began in childhood. Right? So he says, 23, I've been in the habit of misusing the order of nature. The proper purpose of the sensory perceptions given me by nature is simply to inform the mind of what is beneficial or harmful for the composite of which the mind is a part. And to this extent, they're sufficiently clear and distinct but I use them as reliable rules for immediately discerning the essence of the bodies located outside us, about which they signify nothing that is not obscure and confused. Right? So the mistake then is to use perceptions given to us to inform the mind of what's harmful or, hurt or um, helpful for the mind-body composite as things that tell us about bodies as they are in themselves. We can just read off the nature of bodies, intrinsic nature of bodies, the nature of bodies as they are in themselves, off our sensory perceptions. No, because bodies as they are in themselves are just these configurations of differently shaped and moving matter. Right. So, so far then, the so-called errors of the senses turn out to reduce to errors of judgment. Right. We go wrong by judging too hurriedly, by forgetting that we should wait until the intellect has examined the matter, by affirming and believing what we're in the habit of affirming and believing, what we've affirmed and believed since childhood. So again, it's all judgment error. He can just tell the same story to reconcile it with God's benevolence as he did in the fourth meditation. So far, so good, maybe. But these claims about what our natures teach, about the purpose for which God has given us sensory perceptions, point us towards cases of genuinely sensory error. 
So he said, internal sensations of pain, thirst, and hunger are given to us to inform us of harms to the mind-body composite, or and what would be beneficial to the mind-body composite. But these sensations can mislead. So in the second part of the sixth meditation, Descartes discusses the cases of the person with pain in a limb which no longer exists, the case of phantom limb pain, and of the person with dropsy who feels thirst when drinking would be harmful. So on Descartes' interpretation of dropsy, dropsy is a condition in which the body is waterlogged, there's too much fluid, so adding more fluid is, makes things worse, but the person feels a raging thirst. So they're getting, as it were, the, they're having the sensation that God has given to the to them to tell them that the body needs fluid when it doesn't need, but it doesn't need fluid. So Descartes says in 24, I've already looked in sufficient detail at how notwithstanding the goodness of God, my judgments are false. Right, that was the fourth meditation. But a further problem now comes to mind regarding those very things which nature presents to me as objects which I should seek out or avoid, and also regarding the internal sensations where I seem to have detected errors. Right, so there seem to be errors in the internal sensations, error in the sensation of pain, which Descartes, to be a sensation, Descartes takes to be a sensation, a perception of damage to our body, because the person with phantom limb pain perceives damage in a limb which doesn't exist. Right? Errors in the case of dropsy, because the person uh, with dropsy feels thirst, right? they, as it were, they have the sensation that's given to them by nature to tell them when the body needs drink, but the body doesn't need drink. In fact, drink would be harmful to the body. So these natural sensations are misleading. Right? And this Descartes calls a true error of nature. So here we really do have an error of nature, an error in the nature that God has given us. Sensations that are part of our God-given nature that lead us astray. And his explanation of this second kind of error is completely different from the explanation of judgment error, as one would expect. The explanation of this sensory error, this genuinely sensory error, which turns out to be quite circumscribed on Descartes' view, turns on the difficulties of having an efficient signaling system in a thing that's a composite of a mind and a body, given the nature of body. Right. So how do we find out about damage to the foot? Right. There's a nerve running from the foot to the brain, which in Descartes' view is just like a kind of string. Right. Or, well, actually, sorry, like a kind of tube. Descartes had a hydraulic view of how nerves work. Obviously, nobody knows about electricity in this period. Um, so damage to the foot causes motions in the foot, which causes motions of spirits in the nerves, which opens pores in the brain, which causes ideas in the mind, right? And I perception of pain as in the foot, right? But because the nerve goes all the way from the foot to the brain, if the nerve gets moved in the right way at any point during its length, you'll have a feeling of, foot, of pain as in the foot. Right? So he says, this is 25, Notwithstanding the immense goodness of God, the nature of man as a combination of mind and body is such that it is bound to mislead him from time to time. For if a cause not in the foot but in one of the parts through which the nerves pass from foot to brain, or in the brain itself, excites the same motion that is excited by injury to the foot, pain will be felt as if it were in the foot. The sensation is naturally deceptive. So notice that he doesn't shy away from saying that here there's something that's natural and therefore produced by God but deceptive, because the same motion in the brain must always produce the same sensation in the mind, and as the motion more frequently arises from a cause which injures the foot than from another existing elsewhere, it accords with reason that it always exhibits to the mind pain in the foot rather than in another part. So the thought is, the motion in the brain that leads to the sensation can only represent one thing, right? Only one sensation can be tied to this motion in the brain. The best thing for it to be tied to is a sensation of pain in the foot, because that's what that motion is most usually going to be caused by. So, of course, God isn't going to tie it to a sensation that represents something that it very, is very, it very rarely causes it, like a motion somewhere in the nerve caused by something that's happening in the back. Right? So, God has chosen the most efficient signaling system, but it's one that can't, is always going to be liable to error. So, he continues... And if sometimes dryness of throat arises not from drinks being conducive to the health of the body, but from some other causes, as what happens in one with dropsy, it is far better that it thus deceives than if it always deceives when the body is well constituted, and so for the rest. Right, so there's only one sensation that can be attached to the, the motion in the brain, and God has 
set things up so that it's, there's the least deception possible. But there's always going to be possibility of deception given the exigencies of signalling in this mind-body composite. So Descartes says, there's nothing here that doesn't testify to the power and goodness of God because God has created the best system possible given the constraints within which God is working, given the nature of matter. So the question I've been focusing on is whether Descartes manages to reconcile our proneness to sensory error with the perfection of our creator. And it seems so far that maybe he does. The first kind of supposedly sensory error, prejudices of the senses and so on, turns out just to be judgment error due to habit of making bad judgments. The second kind, that's genuinely, sens genuinely sensory error, flows from a nature that, according to Descartes, is the best it can be, given that it's an imperfect nature, right? given that it's a kind of imperfect nature. But just before I stop, I just wanted to leave you with a, a final thought that maybe there's a kind of a third kind of error associated with sensory perception that won't fit either of these models. Descartes thinks that distance and size perception, like when I was thinking of visual perception, involves judgment involves ineliminable judgment, as he explains it. If you look back at 18, quotation 18, he says at the bottom of page 2, at the bottom of that quotation, that um, we make rational calculations about the size, shape and distance of the stick, and he demonstrated in the optics how size, distance, and shape can be perceived by reasoning alone, working out any one feature from other features. Right? Presumably, reasoning's actually got to be involved if all that happens at the second stage of sensory response is just perceptions of colour. Right? So you've got a kind of a mosaic of colour, and you've got to work out from, Descartes says, from the boundaries of that, how distant the thing is that's producing this um, response, what its size is, and so on. And so some kind of... Uh, rational calculation, indeed, according to Descartes, some kind of beliefs about the distance of objects, about the shapes of objects, have got to be involved in these kinds of, of calculations. That's how visual perception works, because distance, as it were, can only be, it's not going to be directly registered in the, the retinal image, it can only be worked out through some kind of calculation. But Descartes also says that our methods of registering distance are extremely unreliable. Of course, it's it's things like how much our eyes are moving when they focus, how much the uh, lenses are uh, changing when we focus. Right? This doesn't give us uh, good information or very reliable information about the distance, how far away things are. Right? So it looks as though the way that visual perception works forces us to make erroneous judgments. Right? That's the only way it can work, right? because we've got to make judgments um, to... The intellect has got to somehow be involved in distance and shape perception, right? and it looks as though when, we, when it does so, it's going to be forced, somehow we're going to be forced to make judgments that are based on less than perfect information. We're going to be forced to make judgments based on obscure and unconfused perception. Right? And it's not that we forget, as with De Descartes' other story about judgment errors, to wait until the intellect has examined the perceptions. It's not that we... Um, it isn't due to lack of time, right? It seems to be the way that the system's designed, right? And so they don't quite seem to fit his story about judgment error, but they also don't seem to fit his story about genuinely sensory error, like the error that's involved in phant phantom limb pain and dropsy, because we're not talking about here misleading sensations. They're not just sensations, they involve judgment. And they're not occasional errors that happen when things aren't working as they generally do, they're ones that seem to be an ineliminable, il, 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 ineliminable part sorry, of the operation of the visual perception system in us <laughs> as mind-body composites. So maybe there's a third kind of error associated with the sensation that Descartes doesn't actually have a, a good explanation of, that he, can't, he was going to find more difficult to reconcile with the fact that we're supposedly the creations of a perfect god. What would Descartes' attitude to this thought be? I suspect he, in some ways, wouldn't care that much. Right? The aim of the meditations, as I've been, I've been sketching it, is to tell us about how to get the fundamental structure of the world right, to tell us 
what the fundamental nature of the material world is, what our fundamental nature is as thinking things, and what the nature of God is, and to tell us that we know these things on the basis of innate ideas and not on the basis of sensation. So Descartes says, clear and distinct perception is what we must be guided by in the contemplation of the truth. Right? In the conduct of life, we sometimes have to rely on obscure and distinct perception. And the point of the meditations I've been suggesting is not to seek certainty, but to seek truth, right? to correct our false beliefs. Right? He says in that first quotation that he was struck by the large number of falsehoods he'd accepted as true in my childhood. Right? The, the edifice based on them is doubtful because it's based on falsehoods. It's not doubtful because he doesn't have sufficient, because of some inability to respond to sceptical doubts. So it's truth that Descartes after and According to Descartes, it's innate, clear, and distinct ideas that lead us to the truth. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you.